Hello, my name is Sergey, and today I'm going to talk about security challenges in Ethereum smart contract programming. So here is a brief outline of my talk. First of all, I will give some introduction, some kind of brief motivation why this problem is important and interesting. Then I will discuss five security challenges in Solidity programming. Then I will give some practical advice on how to write smart contracts securely. And then I will conclude. A little bit on my background, I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Luxembourg in the S&T uh, Center and Cryptolux Research Group. My supervisor is Professor Alex Birkov, and my main topic is security of Ethereum in uh, multiple aspects. I have some previous background in code analysis and automated vulnerability detection. So as you might already know, blockchain is very hot right now. The total market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies increased eightfold since the beginning of 2017. We see the boom of initial coin offerings and other innovative financial applications. Uh, but new uh, technologies, new innovations cannot happen without some security issues. So Ethereum introduced new execution paradigm, this trust trustless network of nodes that execute uh, the code in parallel. There is a whole, whole software stack developed from scratch by the develop, developers at the Ethereum Foundation, namely they are developing the consensus protocol, the uh, programming languages, the compilers for those languages and the virtual machine. And the environment in which Ethereum exists is very hostile. There are financially motivated attackers who are mostly anonymous. So compared to the situation of say, uh, Facebook identity, identity theft, where the attacker has to figure out how to monetize this information. Here, if your smart contracts contain, contain some non-trivial amount of money, it is a bug bounty in itself. So um, an anonymous attacker who can figure out how to execute your code in some unexpected ways can just take the money and run, and uh, those attackers usually don't get caught and don't get punished in any way. So here, is a, here are two examples of massive security breaches from the past. Uh, the first one is the famous DAO hack from June 2016, when a, a massive crowdfunding project called the DAO was hacked and about $60 million worth of Ether was stolen. Uh, the second one is the more recent event in July 2017. A popular multi-signature wallet called Parity was also hacked and about three about $30 million worth of Ether was stolen from multiple worlds who were using this same uh, insecure code. So to put us on all one page, I will brief briefly describe how Ethereum functions. So similar to Bitcoin, we have addresses and we have a, um, uh, accounts in Ethereum and there are accounts who, which are controlled by a private key like in Bitcoin. If I had the private key that corresponds to some particular uh, address, that means that I can send Ether from that address. But uh, there is also another type of accounts in Ethereum. Uh, they are controlled by uh, the corresponding piece of code, which is called a smart contract. Uh, the Ethereum network consists of nodes. Uh, nodes store uh, and share the common view on the global state of the world, namely for each account they store the balance, the corresponding code, if there is any code, and the corresponding data. Uh, they execute code of smart contracts on request, and they uh, perform the proof of work, similar mechanism to uh, what Bitcoin uses, produce new blocks and extend the blockchain to uh, reflect the latest changes in the state of accounts. So if I'm a developer and I want to um, to develop a decentralized application. I write smart contracts in a high-level language. Usually it is, it is Solidity, though it is not the only language that can be used for Ethereum smart contracts. I compile my contracts to bytecode of the Ethereum virtual machine and I deploy it to the blockchain. If users want to interact with my contract, to send some money to my contract or perform some computations, they sign transactions and broadcast them into the network. 
the nodes listen to the network, they um, pick up these transactions, perform the corresponding computations, and update the state. Uh, to limit the scope of this talk, I will now um, talk about three types of blockchain developers. So there are core protocol developers who are creating the basic low-level inf infrastructure of this network. Namely, they are developing the virtual machine, the languages and the compilers, and the consensus mechanisms. Uh, this is not our main focus today. We assume that this basic infrastructure uh, is working as intended. We are focusing on the second type of developers, contract developers, who are building smart contracts on top of this existing infrastructure. And there is also a third type of developers, the application developers, who create applications in more traditional languages and frameworks um, that can be web applications written in JavaScript or in other languages or uh, mobile applications that interact with blockchains using some kind of API. So now I'm going to discuss five challenges, five things that you should definitely keep in mind if you want to develop secure smart contracts in Solidity. The first challenge is external calls. Uh, Ethereum contracts can communicate with other contracts. And on the one hand, it's very useful because Contracts can leverage each, each other's functionality. Um, they can uh, use each other's functions and so on. But external contracts can be malicious. And when you, as a developer of a smart contract, want to communicate with some external entity, you should not assume that that external entity would, will behave in the way that uh, is suitable for you. You should expect that there might be an attacker on that external address. So here's an ex as a, here is an example. So consider a smart contract that holds a mapping of user balances and, the, uh, and it implements a function called withdraw. So if I have some balance stored in this contract, I can withdraw the um, some amount of ether that corresponds to my balance. So in line number four, we calculate the amount of ether that I have the right to withdraw. Then in line number five, what you have here is message sender is actually the address of the of the user who initiates the, the the execution which is now being performed. So it's my address if I want to withdraw money. And this address is being called with value equal to amount calculated previously. And then empty brackets, um, to note that there is no uh, auxiliary data in this call. So the logic of this call is that um, this contract is trying to pay me the amount of money I'm entitled to. If something goes wrong for whatever unexpected reason, uh, the call will be reverted. Will be reverted. It is the line number six. And then if everything succeeds, then the balances will be updated to reflect the fact that I have now a zero balance in this contract. I have withdrawn my money. But something can definitely go wrong here. The problem here is that an external contract at address message.sender can call the same withdraw function again and due to the fact that the balances have not yet been updated, the second call to withdraw will still succeed. So if I want to perform an attack on this vulnerable smart contract, I will implement my own contract, deploy it on some address, and perform a call from that address. Then the execution will uh, be given to my contract back at line number five, and I will call withdraw function back, and I can do that many times, but my balance will be decreased only after all this um, recursive execution complete. So that allows me to withdraw many times more money than I have. This, in essence, is the bug that caused the DAO contract to lose $60 million. So here is a proposed solution to this problem. Uh, compared to the previous example, here in line number four, we first decrease 
the balance to zero and only then we perform the actual transfer. In this case, if everything goes according to plan, everything is fine. If sending money fails for some reason, that everything will be reverted, including the balance, so nobody will lose any money. But if uh, there is a malicious contract at message.sender address, if it tries to call withdraw once again, the balance would already been set to zero and the second withdrawal will not succeed. This programming pattern can be generalized uh, as following. Checks, effects, interactions. If you are interacting with an external contract, you should first perform the necessary checks, check that some invariance hold that the user is really entitled to the amount of money or that action that they are trying to perform, then you perform effects on your internal state. You update your own ex in internal balances and only then you communicate with external contracts. Because after you communicate with external contracts, you should make no assumptions on the state of your internal invariance because they may have been changed by this malicious external entity. So checks, then effects, then interactions. The second problem is that miners influence execution. It is worth considering that miners, though, can, uh, though they cannot change the code of smart contracts and they definitely cannot change the transactions because transactions are signed by the authors of those transactions, they can censor transactions, they can deny you service, even if you pay high enough fee, in principle, nothing prevents miners from not, um, from not processing your transaction. They can also reorder transactions, which uh, causes problems like front-running. For example, if you imagine some kind of marketplace implemented as an Ethereum smart contract, so there's some kind of market of some tokens, uh, there are bit orders and ask orders, so say I want to buy 100 tokens, and I create a transaction with my buy order um, and uh, put it on the blockchain, the miner sees my order and the miner can uh, front run. The miner can purchase this 100 tokens for me and then resell it to me at a higher price, profiting from the fact that it can influence the order of these transactions. Um, so if you are implementing any kind of game where it's important to be the first or any kind of auction, you should definitely keep in mind that miners influence transactions and can reorder transactions. And then um, Solidity and other languages have, um, have uh, variables that let you get access to uh, things like the current timestamp or the hash of the latest block, which can be very useful, but you should also remember where this information comes from. It also originates from miners. So consider this example. This is a very insecure lottery. It has a function determined winner. So we have here two players, player one and player two. And if the current timestamp is um, even, then the first player is declared the winner. Otherwise, the second player is declared the winner. If one of those players is the miner, the miner can tweak timestamp a little bit so that uh, it always wins. So if you want to implement any kind of game or auction, as being said, do some cryptographic protocol like a commit reveal scheme where users first commit hashes of the actual values that they want to commit um, that they want to submit, uh, then the contract moves on to the next stage and then players reveal their bids and if hashes match, then the winner is de determined according to the, uh, to the initial values. If you need any kind of randomness, uh, you should use secure randomness sources. Some of the sources might include uh, Randau, which is a smart contract on Ethereum that provides you with random values obtained from multiple parties. You can use information from, from Bitcoin block headers using uh, projects like BTC Relay. 
and you can also connect to a trusted third party centralized oracles. Uh, but in any case, um, it is very hard to obtain the comparable speed and comparable volume of randomness as with centralized solutions. So challenge number three is immutability. So of course you might ask uh, if immutability is actually a good thing, probably it is. It's actually one of the main value propositions of open blockchains. So you cannot change the rules of the game. And that is definitely a good thing, but there is a caveat from the point of view of the developer. If your contract is deployed and then you detect a bug in it, you can do nothing about that. A deployed contract cannot be patched. And it means that you have to test your contracts before deployment fully. So consider this contract. Uh, it is actually a black hole. It is a provable way to burn your money. So as we see in line number two, uh, this contract implements a default function which is payable. That means that it can receive Ether. And it also has a function that can uh, tell you how much Ether this contract has received so far. But there is no way to withdraw money from this contract. So of course this is um, a simplified case. But in more complex contracts, um, which can be visualized as some kind of state transition uh, scheme, if withdrawal is possible only at some states but not at other states, beware of dead ends. So if your contract is transferred to some state where money cannot be withdrawn from that and it also cannot tra transition into another state, that means that money will be lost forever. Uh, you have to deal with immutability. You have to test your contracts before deployment. You should uh, limit the number of functions that can receive Ether. If you don't need it for your functionality, if you don't expect any payments, then reject them. And generalizing um, the thing I said about the state transitions, avoid unrecoverable states. Challenge number four is privacy. All transactions in blockchains, in Ethereum and in Bitcoin are broadcast in plain text and anybody can read it, can read them. Uh, what's even more interesting, anyone can download the whole, the whole blockchain and analyze the history of transactions. There are projects and companies who specialize in analyzing blockchain transactions and linking them together. As far as I know, they're mostly focused on Bitcoin blockchain right now, but maybe as Ethereum gets more popular, they will also uh, pay attention at Ethereum blockchain. Contrary to a popular belief, the private modifier in Solidity code uh, does not actually hide any data from anyone. It just means that this variable cannot be altered by an external smart contract but still all participants of the network can see the data. Because in open blockchain, everybody should be able to verify the data. And the final challenge is not a security challenge per se, but I think that this is important and I should mention it because it's important for developing uh, useful and correct smart contracts. So as you may know, Users in Ethereum pay for every execution steps, uh, for every execution step, and um, these prices are determined in terms of units of gas. If you compare this to centralized cloud providers like Amazon, Amazon is not just cheaper; it is many, many orders of magnitude cheaper. That means that, despite the fact that Ethereum uses a catchy phrase world computer in its advertisements, or at least it used to do so. It is definitely not a generic computer, and it is definitely not a cloud storage, because storage is one of the most expensive operations in Ethereum. So he here are, uh, here is a snapshot of the so-called yellow paper, which is uh, a more or less formal definition and specification of Ethereum. And here are some costs, relative costs of operations are defined here. So we have operations that costs starting from zero 
or 2, 3, 5, 8, 10 units of gas. Compare that to, for example, the cost of storing uh, some piece of data, which is 20,000, or the cost of creating a new contract, which is 32,000 units of gas. So here is an example. This function, from the point of view of traditional programming languages, costs absolutely nothing. You just go through an array, you multiply some numbers, which are not very large, and you store the result into the array. But running this code on the actual Ethereum blockchain costs about 60 US dollars, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, but what's even more important that transaction um, which aims to call this costly function will likely never be confirmed because executing this function costs about 5 million gas, which is pretty close to the block gas limit. In Ethereum, the total amount of gas consumed by all transactions in one block cannot exceed the block gas limit. That means that you should optimize your contracts for gas costs. You should avoid iterating over arrays, especially over large arrays, and especially over arrays which you don't know the size of. Imagine a situation where, where you have um, an array of users, and users can freely register with your contract, extending this array, and then some function goes through the array of all users and performs some, say, payments. That means that your contract, uh, your contract is vulnerable because a malicious user can register many fake users in your contract and your payment cycle will fail because it will not fit into the block gas limit. So instead of, in this case, instead of um, going through loop and paying everybody, uh, paying for the gas yourself, implement another mechanism, a pull mechanism instead of push mechanism, let every user withdraw their funds, implement a withdraw function that means that you will share the gas costs between users and their transactions will more likely fit into the block. Uh, you should measure and optimize gas consumption, so compilers and developer tools provide this functionality. And you should really think about what functionality is worth putting onto the blockchain. You should move all computation except security critical ones off the chain and only um, perform some kind of anchoring using hashes or something like that with the actual blockchain. So here is a takeaway uh, about the five issues that I discussed. External is dangerous. Beware of external contracts. Miners can influence execution. They can censor or reorder transactions and they can provide uh, not very accurate environmental data. Contracts are immutable. You cannot patch a contract if you find a bug after deployment. That means that you have to test it very um, test it fully before deployment. Blockchain is not private. Don't put any private data in it because it's not really private anymore in that case. And on-chain computation is very, very expensive. So now we have discussed some problems and now some proposed solutions or um, some kind of practical advice for smart contract developers, how to write secure contracts. So first of all, write the specification. You cannot uh, fix incorrect code if you do not define what is correct code. Describe what you actually want to accomplish before trying to implement it. Um, think about um, if the blockchain, if the open blockchain like Ethereum is really the appropriate tool for your use case. Maybe you should go for a traditional centralized database, which is much more robust and powerful, and it has years and years and decades of development put into that compared to Ethereum, which is two years old. Maybe you should, uh, instead of using the, the public Ethereum blockchain, you should use a private instance of the same Ethereum code base. Maybe you should go for and other permissioned alternatives like Hyperledger, Corda, or something like that. Think about what is appropriate for your use case because just, just because Ethereum is the most trendy uh, word doesn't mean it, it suits your particular use case. So maybe you will arrive at, arrive at diagram that looks like this. But if you don't, if you decide that you really want 
to implement your functionality in Solidity, then you should check your source code. There are multiple documents, uh, multiple tutorials and academic papers available online that summarize the best and the worst development practices. You should make yourself familiar with those documents. You should adhere to best practices and avoid the worst practices. You should use uh, up-to-date software um, because sometimes, even now, they find bugs in the compiler or in development frameworks. So make sure that the compiler is up-to-date and keep an eye on the recent announcements about um, recently found vulnerabilities. There are multiple tools available that can statically analyze Solidity source code and find suspicious patterns or some signs of bad programming practice, so you should use those tools as well. After you compile um, your source code into the bytecode, you should remember that compiler may have bugs and the Ethereum blockchain doesn't care about your source code, it only cares about the bytecode because that is what is actually executed. There are some tools available for bytecode analysis as well. Another branch of uh, development is called formal verification. I'm not aware of any tools which are available now, but you should keep an eye on that because in the following months or maybe a year or two, they will definitely be developed. Uh, these are more sophisticated uh, tools which, um, which mathematically prove that your implementation corresponds to your formal specification. But in order to implement them, you have to have some kind of formal semantics for the language and for the virtual machine. This is a work in progress. And step number four, uh, you should test your whole uh, decentralized application or DAP as a whole. So you don't usually only have smart contracts. You have smart contracts and some interface written in JavaScript or in other traditional language. So modern development frameworks such as Truffle provide you with functionality with testing functionality, you can write this single line truffle test and the truffle framework will automatically go through all the tests that you define. So make sure to cover all your functions, all your cases, uh, and run tests to make sure that while you are improving your code, you don't break anything that used to work. So in, in conclusion, smart contracts are still a new technology. It's very exciting. Its potential uh, is enormous, but of course security issues are inevitable. So you should uh, proceed carefully, you should uh, follow the recent developments uh, on the security vulnerabilities, you should use the latest versions of software and the tools for automated analysis um, and uh, write secure contracts. So if you have any questions, and here are the websites of the SNT Center of Crypto Lux Research Group, as well as my personal website. Thank you.